waiting, please turn your Bibles to the book of Acts. The book of Acts, chapter 17. So, New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. And we're going to be spending time in verses 22 and onward. I think there's pretty much three types of people here this morning. Um, Those that know the Lord, that are in relationship with Him and can learn from this passage on how to defend their faith, how to give a defense of the gospel as it will see Paul is doing. The second person is, maybe you're here this morning and you need to be encouraged to know that God is who He says He is and has revealed Himself accordingly so that we may know Him, that we may reach out for Him, that we may grope for Him, as the Apostle says, and that we may trust in Him and all His ways and how He has obviously revealed Himself. And then, the third person is that you might be here this morning and you might be a skeptic. In other words, you might be questioning if this is all true. So that's my target audience this morning. It's each and every one of you. I trust I've categorized you accordingly. If not, don't come and speak to me afterwards. Uh, how I believe we are going to approach this passage. It's a really, really important passage. And we'll see what is happening as a little background is that Paul has now gone on to his second missionary journey. Right? And he's approaching an area, and he's in actually in Athens. Now many of you might have been to Athens. And here Paul is seeing something that really grieves his heart. He's grieved in his heart. He's provoked in his heart. And his spirit within him is vexed because the city was given over to idols. Now, each and every one of us, if we were to take a drive not even five miles within the radius of the church, we will see that cities are given over to idols. Right? And I'll explain to us as we go through this passage why it's so important for us to understand what Paul is saying here regarding idolatry. Paul then, while he was in Athens, went to a place called the Agora. The Agora was an area where the uh, Eropagites gathered, right? And they were a council that looked over religion, so religious matters, moral matters, and educational matters. And what, what Paul was doing is he was reasoning with the Jews in the synagogue. He was reasoning with Gentile worshipers, those God-fearers who had not yet heard the gospel message that Jesus Christ has risen. And then he was obviously speaking to the Athenians, who were very, very good in their own eyes regarding philosophy. Now today, we are also approached with many, many types of philosophies that are keeping us from the simplicity that is in the gospel. Right, and this morning we're going to look at the difference between these philosophies and the simple message of the gospel, and how we can grow in the gospel message. Remember, when we look at any worldview, right, a worldview is something that determines how you see and perceive the world. And that comes from various ways of upbringing. It comes from various ways of understanding how truth may have been revealed to you to an extent. But what you must remember this morning is that each worldview has four answers or questions they need to answer. And they're very simple questions. What am I, why am I here? Right? What is the meaning of life? Okay, and then what is the why or how do I get a moral code, a moral compass? Where does that come from? And destiny, where am I going when I die? And at the outset, I'm going to ask you this morning is when you put your head on the pillow tonight and your heart stops beating, where are you going? That's a very, very important message for us or or question for us to answer this morning. And that is, you can answer those in a coherent manner. Origin, meaning, morality, and destiny. Where am I from? Why am I here? Where do I get a morality from? And where am I going? These are super important in approaching the Christian worldview. Because I submit this morning that the Christian worldview is that the only one that answers these perfectly. And you'll see that Paul continues to walk in the uh, Agora in this area. 
and then he is approached by these people that are known as Epicureans and Stoics. Now, they are members of schools of philosophy. Now, your Epicureans quickly were disciples of Epicurus in and around 300 BC. And they believed that pleasure was the greatest good and the most worthy pursuit of man. And similarly today, there's a philosophy called hedonism. Hedonism says that man's pursuit and man's purpose is to gain his own pleasures, to have as much pleasure as he can possibly attain to. The Epicureans also believed that this pleasure was in the sense of tranquility, freedom from pain, disquieting passions and fears, and the fear of death. Now, the book of Hebrews categorically says that you will only lose the fear of death once you know your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? And so the Epicureans' idea of God was that He was above the world, but they had nothing to do with the world. He had nothing to do with His subjects that He created. He just let them run riot. On the other hand, your Stoics, who were another group of philosophers, and just bear in mind, put yourself in this area that Paul is now going to address these people. And I believe Paul is addressing us in this manner as well because of the certain philosophies that we've been taught. And the Stoics were following the teachings of Zeno, and he was a Cypriot. Also in and around the same time, 300 BC, and his followers placed great importance on living in harmony with nature. Now, can you see this today? Right? In harmony with nature, they stressed individual self-sufficiency and rationalism. And they had a reputation for being quite arrogant. You can see that today in humanism. Humanism says the exact same thing. We can only determine things by our experience, and the supernatural is something that is not attainable. We can't understand it, so therefore it's disregarded. And what does that mean? That means that we're being self-sufficient. We want to do things our way, contrary to the Lord's way. They were pantheists, and that means that they believe, that they believe and this is what pantheists still believe today, that God is in everything, right? And that everything is God. So a dog can be God. A mountain range, which you really, really admire, can be God. So pantheism, you can hear, is illogical. And as we get into this, I'll explain to you why it is. And furthermore, you'll see that Paul starts preaching to them about Jesus and the resurrection. Now, anywhere where you go and preach Jesus and the resurrection, you're going to get resistance. Right? And he's getting in a huge amount of resistance in this passage and it's very, very interesting that they then say to him, come to the Aeropagus. Come to Mars Hill. Remember, Mars Hill is still portions of it is standing today. And this is where they would reason on new philosophies. And they were calling Paul a babbler. And a babbler in the Greek, in the, in the interpretation, is that they were calling him this so-called philosopher that picked tidbits from each religion and then wanted to present it to them. And it's very, very interesting how Paul approaches this. But they say, you are bringing strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know these things and what they mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who there spend time in nothing else but to tell or hear some new thing. And the simple question to you and I this morning is, is that are we running around wanting to hear about the latest and greatest thing when the truths of the gospel have been evident for 2,000 years? Right? You get social media, you get some guru that comes on the stage and he tells you that you're actually this. You've descended from an ape or a cat or a fish tail or whatever you want to talk about. And immediately we know the truth, the truth resists that, but then they tickle our ears. And we start believing what they're saying. So this morning, let's read from Acts chapter 17 from 22 up until 34. And let's see what Paul's address means to us this morning in our context. Follow along with me, verse 22. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God, who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. 
nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of our own poets have said, your own poets, sorry, have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought to not think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or, or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, We will hear you again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, importantly, some men joined him and believed. Among them Dionysius the Aeropagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. If you look at verses 22 and 23, you can see Paul has now been called to the midst of this Aeropagus. And he addresses the men, or addresses them rather, as men of Athens. Now remember, as I said earlier, they are the council that gathers, that um, brings the ruling of the city. So re remember with regards to morals, education, and the like. And he says to them, I perceive in all things that you are very religious. If Paul had to walk into your house or my house this morning, would he say the same thing? I perceive you're religious. Right? The photos that you have on your walls. I'm not saying you can't have photos, but here where I'm going with this. The things that are in abundance in our houses that overlook the things of the Lord. The things that we are obsessed about. Would Paul say to us immediately, I perceive that you're religious. Or would he come and say, I can see you serve Jesus Christ. And that's a very important question as Paul opens his address to the Athenians. Because he sees, as he was passing through in verse 23... And considering the objects of their worship, he found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Now, if you've picked up, they were trying to cover all their bases with all the deities that they had. Right? So you had Zeus, for example. You had Hermes. You had Diana. You had Apollo. I mean, we can go on and on and on with these Greek deities that they were worshiping. And Paul was obviously really, really vexed and concerned about this because they had not really met the one true God. However, he sees this altar that has the one to the unknown God. And he must have been thinking, wow, these, these, these folks are covering all their bases just in case there is a God out there who is real and true. I hope he receives our worship. It's like polytheism, right? And it's fascinating what Paul does here. Paul says to him, okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it into your court. The God that you don't know, I'm going to preach to you. I'm going to share Him with you. You know, you're so fancy with all your sculptures. You're so fancy with all your idolatry. I'm going to preach this God to you. So He says to them at the end of verse 23, The one whom you worship without knowing Him, I proclaim to you. Right? And that brings us to our message this morning. And I want to preach on this. Seeking God in absolute darkness. That is in idolatrous times. I believe, folks, that we are living in darkness and we are living, living in extremely idolatrous times. And what Paul is saying in verse 23 or verse 24 as we go along, notice what he says there. He says, I'm going to proclaim this, this unknown God to you, the one that you don't know, the one that you're ignorant of. The Greek word for unknown in that context is the word agnostic. Right, So we know that agnostic means that you're ignorant of something. That's what agnosticism is. It's a worldview or a belief, but it's ignorant of belief. Right, a contradiction in terms, but anyway. Verse 24, God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. So Paul starts his address to the Athenians by contrasting idolatry 
with the greatness of God. He's saying that God that you don't know, He is creator. And we can see today, if we look up at the heavens, if we look up at the stars, if we look up at the skies, we have to understand that there must be a creator. It is impossible that the complexity of life came about by chance. The earth's axis is an exact axis so that it doesn't fall over, essentially. It's at the perfect distance from the sun that there's light and life and sunshine. Our bodies have the exact amount of letters in to determine our movements. Our DNA system, our DNA has little motors in it that look like onboard motors that repair proteins every time something happens in our body. This is impossible that it comes out by chance. And that's why Paul's saying, God, and remember Paul is a Hebrew. He was zealot, or zealous rather. He was a Pharisee, and he would have said, Yahweh, the great I am, the eternal God, He is the one that I'm proclaiming to you. And what does God do? He made the world and everything in it. So firstly, we have to determine this morning that do we actually believe that we live in a world created by our Creator? Because without that, everything else falls flat in our arguments. And He is Lord of heaven and earth. He says they, they do not dwell, He does not dwell, sorry, in temples made with hands. And we have to look at idolatry this morning and confront it head on in each and every one of our own lives. Where are we being so idolatrous that we can't even remember that God is God and He is the one that has revealed Himself? Can it be that we are worshipping our own family members? Right? Are we putting our friends, our children, everything above God? Are we putting our love for cars, our love for sports, our love for television, and all those things and the like, are we putting those things above God? Because God is looking for a bride that will serve Him in all perfection, that will try and serve Him as much to their ability and holiness and obedience as they can. Are we worshipping the houses we live in? Are we worshipping the cars that we drive? Right? This can go on and on and on. In South Africa, we have, we have restaurants. You know, we don't live in the bush in totality. We have restaurants and things. But it's a far, few and far between where you'll, you'll need to drive, you know, to go and find a good restaurant. But I've never seen a place that has food every, on every corner. Every five meters or 15 feet here, you can actually find something that is going to feed your belly, my belly. And that can also become idolatrous. Have you ever thought about it? Food can become idolatrous. Our stomachs dictate to us when we must eat. Right? You sit, you sit there and you're sitting at the, at, the, at the desk, you're working, and all of a sudden your stomach grumbles. You're like, I'm hungry. Your stomach's like, feed me. You're like, okay, I'm going. Just be patient with me. I'm getting there. <laughs> right? But where do we sit and say, you know what? Stomach, it's, 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 it's not you that's going to dictate to me. These are the examples where anything and everything can become idolatrous. So it's anything that we, A, worship more, that we serve more, that we praise more, and that we have on our lips more. That's idolatry. Are you worshiping something this morning? Are you serving something this morning? Are you spending more time on something this morning other than God? That's what Paul is saying to them. He's saying you're spending so much time fashioning these fancy idols with your hands that you're worshipping the idol, you're forgetting about the one true God. And he goes on in verse 25 to say, Nor is this God that I'm proclaiming to you worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. So if we look at the greatness of God in the first verse that we covered in verse 24, here we can see the goodness of God. The goodness of God is uh, contrasted here with falsified philosophy. And hear me out in what I'm going to say. Firstly, to the contextual setting that Paul is in, he's now addressing the Epicureans. Remember those groups of philosophers that believe that God took no interest in human affairs. Here he says, he gives life to all, breath and all things. So God is intimately involved with his creation. He loves his creation. He's created for a reason and for a purpose. And remember, in our philosophical argument that we put forward in our worldview, that brings meaning. Right? Paul said in verse 24, 
God who made the world and, and everything in it, that's origin. That's where we come from. In verse 25, it gives meaning because he gives life, breath, and all things. And the Stoics, remember, they believed in what was known as self-sufficiency. So obviously, if we're saying God gave life and breath to all things, and the Stoics are saying, but we're self-sufficient. We don't need God. But this morning, I submit that the, your very heart is pumping right now because God is having grace on us. Amen? Amen? Everything we say and do, that's why He wants us to glorify, us in, uh, glorify Him in all our actions. In everything we say, everything we do, because our ability, our diligence, our intentions are what glorify Him. Or what give Him His rightful place. And that means that Paul says to them, don't focus on humanism. Don't focus on you. How many times have people put someone on a pedestal and found out that that person too was going to die? Unfortunately, it's true, right? If you look at these great philosophers of the time, Darwin, for example, who brought up his theory of evolution, everyone thought this is the most amazing thing since sliced cheese or bread, whichever one you prefer, and he's in the grave. He didn't live to see how far his, th his theories would go. Remember, um, Darwinism and evolution is a theory. It cannot be tested. It's a theory. And so Paul is saying to these people, don't listen to falsified philosophy. Don't get involved in your own thinking and try and go into every street corner, which is what they were doing, and try and be a proponent of a new idea and then fall into idolatry. Because everything you'll see here that Paul says to them brings them back to idolatry. And we can very easily, as I mentioned, fall into idolatry. So therefore we can see that falsified philosophy takes us away from God. In the next few verses, he continues to give a defense, but he looks at how God is genius, how his government has been made and ordained, and how we have been deceived into thinking otherwise. Look at verse 26. And he, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the earth or the face of the earth. And he has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. Paul, in perceiving what the Athenians were doing, had the one thing very clever, and it was in mind, and this is a historical fact, that the Athenians were and thought they were the supreme race. Right? They had racial superiority over, they thought they had at least racial superiority over the others. People outside of Athens were a little bit less than they were. They, they knew everything. Right? And I submit this morning is that idolatry comes from thinking that we're better than other people. Hmm? Racial preference. And remember, let's just, let's just clear that one quickly. There's one race. That's the human race. God is created from one blood. What is, what is Paul saying? Paul is saying you don't come from many gods. You come from the giver of life who is created through Adam, and each one of us come from Adam. If you had to go to someone that can really trace the DNA, and there are people that have done this, they trace us back to two people. Fascinating, right? Two people. And I'm going to let you guess who they are. Right? Adam and Eve. And Paul is saying to you, don't think that you are superior to someone else just because you have some nice philosophy that you're trying to be a proponent of. And today we must be careful that we don't have ethnical, or um, if, if, if we have to use the words racial, but I don't want to use it, anything that makes us think we're better than someone else. That's a very dangerous ground. Because what that is doing is that in turn, it's being we idolizing ourselves. Idolizing where we're from. Idolizing our heritage. You know, at the end of the day, each and every one of us here are going to, our hearts are going to start beating. And we're going to have to be answerable to the Lord. And therefore, people around you that you think are less than you, we're in danger of thinking that we're superior. And that's why he says to them, don't think you're superior to anyone. God has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on the face of the earth. And then he says he has appointed or pre-appointed times and boundaries and dwellings. And what Paul is saying to them here is, is that God determines the times of the nations, right? Their seasons, when they rise and fall, and their boundaries. In other words, what he's saying is God is all-powerful, 
all-knowing and all-present, ever-present, right? We know those words as omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. So in other words, God is sovereign over political and military affairs of nations. Now, I know when you look at the governments today, you can, you, we all think the same thing. How is it possible that God has ordained this government, that government, whatever government? But remember, it is an opportunity, I believe, for them to come to repentance and to serve the living God and to govern accordingly to biblical principles. I mean, you think you have political issues here. Yeah, we have serious political issues back home. And many people battle with this question, how could God put this government in place? They are not God-fearing. But remember, God is merciful, He is good, and He wants all people to come to repentance. And through power, through ruling, He gives the people the ability to do that. So in verse 27, Paul continues and he says, God has appointed those boundaries and the like so that they should seek the Lord. You and I should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for Him and find Him though he is not far from each one of us. So what Paul is saying is that God is sovereign, God is in control, but that each and every person has been put in a place to seek God. And my question to you this morning is, if you do not know God, are you seeking Him? And I believe you are because you're here this morning, which is excellent. But seeking God means looking at the following four things. Understanding that God reveals Himself through creation. Right? We can see, if you go stand on the Tahanga or wherever at Big Bear, you can see there is a Creator. It's impossible that the stuff comes about by chance. What happens? Romans chapter 1, as you know, man knows everything. He suppresses the truth in unrighteousness, and he worships the creature rather than the Creator. That's a summary. Very easy, right? Everyone starts by suppressing the truth, We know how to do this, and you'll see that society has given over to their desires. And this morning, you can only walk but 50 meters out of here to see that society has given over to their desires. But God is saying, remember, what at the end of the day, what matters is what God says. He's saying, seek me. Through conscience, you can seek me. The second way that we can seek God. We know that we have been given an innate ability to understand right and wrong, good and evil. Right? Why do we get upset when someone harms a family member, a friend, someone dear to us? Yes, I know someone that's a bit further down from us and we don't really know them or care about them. We have been hardened. I do believe we have been really hardened to society and to how it behaves. But at the end of the day, when you hear something has done, been done to a six-month-old baby or a two-year-old child, we get angry. Where is that from? Right? Thirdly, we look at the Bible. God has revealed Himself in His Scriptures, in His Word. Each and every one of us can now whip our phones out and download at least 20 to 30 translations on our Bible, on our phones. So what does that make us? And I don't really want to say this because it will give you a fright. We're the most accountable people that God has ever put on the face of this earth. We are the most accountable to Him because we have everything. Peter says in in 1 Peter, I think it is chapter 2, that he gives, God gives everything. He gives all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things to us. And here we have his word, and lastly we know about the man, God man, Jesus Christ. We know that the, 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 the fact, the historical fact that Jesus went to the cross, it's a fact of history. We know he went. Many of us here don't understand why he went, but the biggest question you can ever ask yourself is why did Jesus go to the cross? Right? From a a rational perspective, from a reasoning and logical perspective, why did Jesus have to go to the cross? Those four things are what God has given us primarily to reveal himself to us. Creation, conscience, the scriptures, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, Paul says, he's God has put you in a place, me in a place, in the hope. See, even God hopes that you might grope for Him. That's awesome. Even God hopes you might even stretch your arm out and say, Lord, save me. That's all you have to do tonight, if you want, this morning, if you want eternal life, is to grope for God. Lord, I'm a Savior. Save my soul. I need you to wash me and cleanse me from my sin. I trust in your work on the cross. 
Save me, dear God, save me. Look there, you might grope for him, you might find him, and the comfort is, it says there, though he is not far from each one of us. Attacking that Epicurean mindset again that God is outside of any creation and he doesn't care about us. We have the only God in any worldview that cares about us, that cares about his people, that cares about salvation. So remember that as you seek for the Lord. Then something very interesting comes in and he says here in verse 28, For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. For we are also his offspring, right? And you can see here that God is, uh, Paul is saying everything comes from him. He's the provider. He sustains us. Everything's from him. We move. We live. We breathe. We can do anything and everything we like, obviously in, in with regards to how the Lord wants us to, and our heartbeat, our pulse, the way we can actually function is from him. It's an all-encompassing statement Paul is making here. He's saying God gives everything, even as some of your own poets have said. And this is fascinating because in 600 BC, there was a Cretan poet by the name of Epimenides. 600 years before Paul makes this statement, right? And he said this very statement, for we are also his offspring. And you'll see later on, where Paul says, for in him we live and moving and have our being, sorry, at the beginning of verse 28, that was said by a poet, Eratus, and by Cleanthes. So Paul is taking their own poets, their own ideologies, putting it back in their court and saying, but your poets knew the one true God. Very interesting. So he takes the argument, he turns it around and says, this is what I submit to you. So for us that want to really make a defense for the faith, faith sorry, notice your surroundings. Notice what you can use to get to someone, to, under, to help them understand the gospel message. And it is indeed in him, in, in him that we move and live and have, have our being. And what Paul is saying here is he's saying to them, you have to agree with the truth because the truth has already been revealed. That's essentially what he's saying. And the age-old question is that exact question. What is truth? Who asked that question? You remember? Pontius. Pontius Pilate stands before Jesus and he says to Jesus, what is truth? Think about this. Pontius Pilate was looking at the epitome of truth. God incarnate in the flesh, saving man. He knew exactly what he was looking at. His wife even warned him what he was looking at. Right? And the truth, truth is this, it's that which corresponds most to reality. So through the means that I've explained that we see that God has revealed himself, we can see that that is reality. It's truth. It testifies to our hearts and to our minds. And Paul then goes on and he says, Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone or something shaped by art and man's devising. And his case has been firmly built here. We are his offspring. In other words, we come from his creative order. Therefore, do not think that the divine nature can be fashioned by gold or by silver or by stone. What Paul is saying here in one very simple statement is as follows. Idolatry is illogical. Right? Very easy. Idolatry is illogical. If you can fashion something, build something, worship something that can be contained in your mind, it's become an idol. And this is very, very important because we can even idolize things at work. We can idolize people at work or at home. We can idolize anything and everything. So that which is in your way this morning, I pray that you, it, the Lord really shows each and every one of us where do we need to be repentant. Where do I need to take idols out of my life so that God can work by faith, by my trust in Him, by, by my trust in Him freely? God wants to work in us freely. We're the ones that sit and do our own thing. So Paul was saying that God's divine nature is essentially spiritual rather than material. Something the Athenians would not have understood. Remember, they are saying, we have made these idols. 
the gold, the silver, the stone. We've shaped these things by our hands. We've used art. We've put art all over. I mean, if you go to the Louvre today, if it's the right place, I think it is, um, where all these fancy paintings are and all these things, people are worshipping those paintings. There are people that actually stand there mesmerized for like seven hours, just staring at a picture. Okay, I don't understand if someone in here might like art, and that's fine. But what I'm saying is it's still made by man's hands. That's the object, and that's the point of the discussion. So this morning, we really have to consider, brothers and sisters, where is our idol? What is our idol? Remember, something that we worship more, serve more, praise more, or think about more is an idol. Until we reverse that order and get God in the forefront of our thinking, we will remain idolatrous all our days. So the fixation of the material, and hear the statement, the fixation on the material will never understand the spiritual. You and I, if we're fixated on um, material matters, we will be closed off to spiritual matters. Paul says, remember, that the, the carnal man does not understand godly wisdom. He doesn't understand it. And therefore, we have to really, really understand what Paul is saying to us this morning. And lastly, as we go into the, the last closing verses for today, we can see that Paul uses a contrast with the ignorance of who God is, the one true God is, with the grace of God. He contrasts the ignorance of God with the grace of God. And remember, there's always good news. Yes, we get convicted. Yes, we get rebuked. The scripture says, preach the word in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, and exhort with all long-suffering and teaching. So this morning, we have to understand that there is good news. There's encouraging news. You can this morning, I can this morning be set free from our idols by mere trusting in Jesus Christ. By putting Him at the forefront of everything. So Paul says in verse 30, Truly these times of ignorance... God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Contextually, remember the, the gospels coming to Corinth and Athens for the first time, to Greece. Scrap the Corinth, Athens, okay? The gospels being preached there. He's saying God has overlooked your idolatry for many, many years. They still were condemned for serving idols because God revealed himself in certain ways, as I've mentioned. But Paul was saying to them, you actually have to be liberated by this exact point. That God has overlooked your ignorance, but now He's calling all men everywhere to repent. And what we will see is, remember, before Jesus Christ was the law. So from Moses, all the way through to Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that was the, that was the age and dispensation of the law. The, the Jews did things according to how God wanted them to, in sacrificial manner so that they may know who he is, not who the law is, which is what the Pharisees and the Sadducees got wrong. They had to know who he was through that. Before that, people always, or many people have asked me, how did God deal with people before the law was given? And remember, Paul says it was that people were dealt with in an age of conscience. How whatever was revealed to you at that time by God Remember like Abraham. Abraham wanted to serve God. He knew there was one God, a creator, and God revealed himself to him. It was very easy. It was through his conscience he understood God is real. And he spoke to him audibly. Um, Isaac, Jacob, the like, all of them, it carries on. But in this age where we are now, God has overlooked all those things. He's revealed himself through Jesus Christ, and he's now calling everyone everywhere to repent. The writer to the Hebrews Remember in verses, uh, chapter 1, 1 and 2 says, At various times and in various ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He created the universe. So God created the universe through Jesus Christ. God has revealed Himself in Jesus to us today. And it's time, friends, that we stop looking for other things and just say, you know what? The evidence is overwhelming. Jesus is who He says He is. He is God and there is no other. Now there is more light. God has revealed Himself more than previously. And that's why God says, by His revelation of truth, remember, we're on the, we're on the pursuit of truth in this argument, is that Jesus Christ is God and there is no other. So what does biblical repentance look like? 
for you and I today. Biblical repentance is a change of mind or attitude concerning either God and who He is, Jesus Christ and who He is, dead works, and sin. See, it's all good we know all these things, but if we don't believe Jesus died for our sins, it's a mere intellectual exercise. What has to be true intellectually has to become in our heart a manifestation of truth. And therefore, if you look at who God is, Paul is saying this morning, God, He is the Lord of heaven and earth, right? Jesus Christ is the gospel message. He's risen from the dead. He's died for our sins. Dead works, you and I must repent from dead works. Dead works are those things that we do in our own strength to please deity. And remember, God says our good works outside of Him are filthy rags. They are as good as filthy rags. And lastly, sin. And in this portion of Scripture, in verse 31, you can see that God has appointed a day on which Jesus will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom He has ordained. Still speaking of Jesus. He has given assurance of this to all by raising Him from the dead. And Jesus said something very important to His disciples in John 16 verse 8. John 16 verse 8. The Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. Of sin because they do not know Me. So remember we've been speaking about in, in the book of James as well that we can't create a sense of morality. Yes, we have an innate sense of right and wrong in us, but if we create a moral code for everyone to live by, then we're going to be robots. What we're trying to say here is that when God convicts the world of sin that, Je that they do not know Jesus, the fact is that if you're lost this morning, you need to know Jesus. You don't need to brush up on your lifestyle or your... The, way, the, the speed that you drive, or whatever the case may be. Believe me, Jesus will convict you of that very, very well. Amen. Hey, Israel, yeah. Amen, brother, it works. So this morning, we have to understand that Jesus is who He says He is. We need to believe in Him, because then He will fix everything that He needs to. So don't think that you need to come to Jesus, as more, or come to Jesus only when you're clean, or when you've done a certain amount of things where you think you've created a ability to now approach the Lord. Don't wait. Come to the Lord now. It's the best decision you will ever, ever make in your life. So we can see the reason here for repentance. Remember in the previous verse, he's overlooked times of ignorance. God is now calling men to repent. Why is he calling men to repent? Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. And many people think, but why does God have to judge? But the very people that ask that want justice when something is done against them. So why do we want God to judge? Because He's just. And He'll mete out that which He has to mete out, especially to a world that has rebelled against Him for 2,000 years. Since Jesus. 6,000 years if you want the total amount. So that's why it's so important that we realize the reason for repentance, and it's because Jesus is coming soon. There's a judgment day coming. Idolatry, rebellion, sin, self-propagation, self-worship. All those things are what Jesus is coming to judge. Therefore, we can say that He has presented God in this argument as the Creator in His past work. He has shown us who God is as Redeemer in His present work. And He will show us, or He has shown us rather, that God is Judge in His future work. Right? Right? And that's why we need to know that God has ordained Jesus and given assurance of this by raising Him from the dead. And notice what happens at the end. When they heard of the resurrection, some mocked while others said, we will hear you again on this matter. This is a universal argument. It always happens. If people don't want to believe the divine, they don't want to believe the divine. So they'll say the resurrection is false. I've listened to countless arguments by apologists defending the faith, the Christian faith, against atheistic arguments and things like that. And the thing is, is that, friends, this morning, a simple statement, 500 people minimum cannot be mass deceived by the resurrection. 
It's never been recorded in history. It will never be recorded. Not 500 people, all of us here today will give a different story if we witness something. And my simple question is this. If the disciples were being persecuted, right, for believing in this God that raised from the dead, could they not have just washed their hands and said, okay, what I saw was not real? Have you thought about that? Could, I not just, could they not just say it's not real? Please don't persecute me. Please don't hang me upside down. Please don't chop my head off. It's not real. But what did they do? They preached that message unto death. They knew him intimately. They knew he was coming back. So there's going to be scoffers. And scoffers are in the Bible anyway. Timothy talks about them. Lastly, Paul departed from among them. However, some men joined him and believed. Now this is awesome. You have to rejoice at this. Among them, Dionysius, the Eropagite. Right? This man was part of the 30. He was part of those people that believed that the Stoic philosophy or the Epicurean philosophy was that which was true. But after Paul preached the gospel to them, revealed to them who the one true God was, he packed up his, his little suitcase and he said, I'm following Jesus. We should rejoice in that. He believed among them Dionysius the Oropagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with him. And folks, this morning as I try to unpack this huge problem we have today with idolatry, idolatry um, and worshipping things that are not of God, this is always going to keep us from God if we don't repent of those things today. If we don't come to Him today and say, Lord, I've actually idolized things so close to me and I'm sorry. I want to serve you fully. So remember, seeking God in absolute darkness means the following. It means, number one, knowing the greatness of God, that He is creator. Secondly, the goodness of God, that He is provider. Thirdly, the government and genius of God, and that He is ruler. And lastly, the grace of God, because He is the only Savior. And this morning, folks, I really, really encourage each and every one of us to draw near to God. Pull near to Him. Repent where we need to. If you do not know Jesus, come and speak to me. Speak to anyone who can help you to today make the decision to trust in the one true God. Because there is freedom and liberty in knowing your Maker and Creator. Amen? Lord, we thank You for bringing us here this morning. We thank You for this Word. Lord, this address that Paul gives to the Athenians is it's awesome, Lord. It teaches us so much about who you are. May we honor your word. May we repent from idolatry. May we seek your face. May we know that no familial, no cultural, no historical, none of that stuff matters to you, Lord. What matters to you is, is do we know your son? Your word says, Lord, that eternal life is as follows, is as follows that we know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. That's eternal life, Lord, that we may know you more. So we pray for this to work richly in our hearts. Convict us of our sin, dear Lord. Bring us to a point of absolute humility in your eyes. And Lord, we thank you for this, and be with us as we go out today in Jesus' name. Amen.